week is done. Okay, welcome to everybody. While we wait for uh, Sarah, Daniel, and uh, Holg, which is connecting, we are going to start uh, the last uh, symposium of today, uh, which is entitled Sharing Interventions in Community Psychology. We are going to have uh, uh, five contributions, probably two with a video and three uh, with, uh, hopefully, with, with the presenter present. And uh, uh, my name is Andrea Gozzini. I'm a researcher from the University of Florence. It is the fourth time today that I present myself. <laughs> so uh, for, with someone of you, uh, we spent uh, the, the afternoon together. And uh, since... Uh, uh, this should could be a more quiet uh, symposium because the presentation are just five. But uh, uh, nevertheless, uh, I would like to invite you to stay within uh, eight nine minutes for the presentation in order to have hopefully the possibility to share some questions, doubt, or discussion at the end of each one. And uh, so nice to meet you. And uh, depending on your time, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, or good night. Uh, I would like just uh, to start with the first contribution and so to have the opportunity to uh, have the time to discuss a little. And uh, I see uh, Jorge already present. Nice to meet you. Okay, I don't know if I pronounce your name correctly. Uh, and uh, Jorge is from uh, Spain, from the Universidad Pública de Navarra. And uh, he's going to present uh, a talk entitled An Experience-Based Model of Institutional Empowerment Based on the Emerging Challenges of Participation, Transparency, and Social Commitment. Well, it is a great pleasure to share this, this brief time with you. And I'm going to try to, to summarize our experience with, uh, with these models of institutional empowerment, which have tried to promote uh, participation, transparency, and, and social commitment within public institutions. As a bad one, I have to say that uh, organizational empowerment is a, is a, has a great potential for social transformation. But currently, it is a minoritarian development within uh, community psychology. In the past decades, in different societies, we have experiences, uh, social movements who have required from political and public institution greater social commitment, uh, greater citizens' participation, higher transparency, and also uh, a, a clear projection to population well-being. In, in this sense, we think that uh, many of these goals can be achieved with a, with a good application of uh, organizational empowerment strategies that can be applied to gain and to, and to maintain and manage institutional power. In this sense, uh, many people from my context working in community psychology, we, we share the opportunity of shifting the perspective and not only using community psychology as a basis for counter power, as a basis for social movement, but uh, making a transition to community psychology as a basis to gain and manage institutional power. Uh, so our experience with it so within social movements made clear after a period of time that probably it, it was much more useful to enter in institutions and not only fighting institution uh, from, from a, a grassroots perspective. In this sense, uh, our objectives with this work is to expose uh, the, the basic roundings, the dimensions and the intervention strategies we use uh, to, uh, to build an experience basis model of institutional empowerment, which uh, integrates different contributions of uh, classic models and, and recent developments in community action. Uh, the way we have developed this proposal is uh, 
registering and making a, a reflection about the uh, different experiences of institutional and, and political actions in which we have uh, directly or indirectly participated. Such, uh, such experiences have, have to do with mediation and counseling for the constitution and action of local governments, participation in emerging grassroots social movements, and also direct involvement uh, in the management and at, at public institutions. Which theoretical groundings have been relevant to, to develop uh, our action and also to reflect about the results and about the process that have been implemented? First, a classic development in organizational empowerment like Peterson and Zimmerman's models and also Francis Cutter's models, the perspective of integrative conflict paradigms, paradigms also Gender's perspective and uh, mainly uh, many proposals that are derived from new ways of collective action and also recent participatory action research development, which are quite different from, from classic tradition of, of participatory action research, mainly in, in marginal and, and, and deprived communities. And some of the concepts we have uh, used are uh, self-organization, horizontality, hybrid activism, the role of the nations in, the, in, the, in conducting these processes, and also a, a strong use of virtual tools and, and, present, and presential spaces in order to achieve greater participation. Well, uh, th this, I think this model is quite ambitious and I only want to, to show some of its main lines and I'm going to divide this model first in, in some essential goals that we want to reach with our action. Also uh, some global strategies uh, that are uh, general uh, ways of action and also concrete tools that we have used to implement uh, these strategies and to reach these goals. Well, our, one of our main objectives was uh, to gain institutional power and also to link institutional skills to social needs, to perceive uh, social needs of grass to uh, population. And then what we, what we posted, what we think is that uh, electoral process election could be transformed into participatory action research processes. That is, and I'm going to show you our, our little example. We can. We can transform an election process in which usually politicians or responsibles uh, propose what they previously have think. We can transform election campaigns and electoral process into participatory action research process. And in this way, what we propose as a government program can be derived from the proposals and negotiation processes with the population. In this sense, here you have a, a little illustration of these processes in which we collected contribution, we generated a negotiation process to define which areas had broad consensus, which areas should be negotiated, and which if were areas of conflict, and they should be delayed in terms of, of solving them in a, at a medium term. And so we elaborated an, an electoral program, and also we design uh, our government team, which has elected by grassroots members, and uh, by means of election, we gain institutional power and were able to manage this, this power according to community psychology direction and also uh, organizational empowerment strategies. In the government action, we, we set it as main goals, participation, transparency, and, and also synergy between us within Axor, and also uh, we will see it after collective empowerment social commitment promotion of social change and the generation of knowledge about the experience that we were uh, developing in this in this sense one minute we we promoted participation by, by media that enhancing the participated qualified and free decision makings by means of a wide variety of, of, 
of tools, combining also online and presencial resources, consultation, uh, the population about relevant topics using new virtual technologies, uh, implementing systems that have been proven in other contexts like participatory budgets, and also using uh, surveys to promote uh, this, this goal. Um, we, we make an, an important promotion of transparency in the sense to uh, making completely available all the relevant institutional data, procedures, and decision. And also we, we, we seek a synergy between social actors, promoting network by cooperation uh, workshops, and also systematic analysis of common interest. Uh, a very strong part of this model and of our action was to seek collective empowerment. That means empowering low status groups at the institutions and at the population, and also the powering high status roles and instance, uh, well, with a wide set of strategies that I have not time here to, to detail. But uh, mainly, uh, we try to um, depower all power and to increase the power of those who had had previously low power. And here you have. Um, many, many uh, resources that, that have been also pre previously uh, uh, developed. And the, the idea is empowering collectives to uh, achieve uh, a better uh, ability and capacity to communicate, to organize, and also to uh, developing counter power. That means that we can use the power to promote counter power. We can use our power as uh, politicians or as responsible for an institution to promote in the population um, those movements or, or those ideas that challenge the, the acts that we are uh, performing. And in this sense, we favor really uh, social change and alternation between uh, political responsibles. Well, and also trying to, to promote uh, sustainable uh, organizational change and also also learning through action by means of generating knowledge about the experiences we, we were implementing. Well, in this sense, we, we think that our model of institutional power that I simply have very, very briefly summarized can be a good tool to promote transformation processes that can draw public institutions closer to greater transparency, participation, and, and social engagement. And we think that this approach is, is a useful resource to really uh, achieve those goals that, uh, that are typical and, and are challenging community cycles. Well, that's all in 10 minutes. Thank you very much. Thank you to you, Jorge. Yes, I appreciated a lot uh, uh, your effort for presenting this very rich uh, paradigm in 10 minutes. And uh, just to prevent uh, other possible technical problem, I would suggest to let you the chart for sharing, uh, just to try to finish in time your uh, insights and maybe to be back later after the last uh, presentation in real from Sarah, because I'm really scared about the connection here, <laughs> which fallen a couple of times. And uh, even if uh, uh, just as uh, um, insight, uh, I, I was thinking uh, if you uh, consider it, uh, uh, the construct of collective intelligence together with collective empowerment, my, my opinion is that this is a construct uh, mainly uh, adopted by cognitive uh, psychologists, but uh, that should be considered also from community psychologists, uh, maybe using the alien models uh, or, you know, the collective mental maps uh, and this kind of fascinating construct that actually we don't, we don't use uh, so frequently in community psychology, but there can be a, a framework or a scaffolding that uh, also to explain how all these tools, dynamics, processes could be merged together in order to create new perspectives, new um, empowerment dynamics, let's say. But as I would like just uh, to know from you if this is really crazy or it could sound <laughs> in your opinion. 
Well, we, we have not thought about that, uh, but I think that what what we are building uh, through a process like this, it's a, a very complex, variable and mutating uh, reality. So the fact of reificating or giving a, a, a substantial category to it, I think it possibly is, is 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 a reification. I mean, is is seen with our categories. What probably in reality is is not clearly defined. But obviously, all, all contributions are are always uh, welcome in this sense. No, exactly because it's a, a quite fuzzy um, construct of the collective intelligence one. I think that uh, it would be adapted and maybe also stretched in order to uh, to be a, another piece of this story. Hi, Russian. Hello. Uh, you're from Australia, is that right? So That's right, yeah. It's night there. Yeah, it's 2 a.m. nearly. Oh, wow. So we appreciate, we will appreciate even more your contribution. And <laughs> oh, thank you very much for being with us. Uh, here are around, uh, around half past five. Uh, <laughs> But since we started to, to today at 1 a.m., I think we are more or less in the same position of you. Okay, <laughs> great. So, Rachel is from uh, Charles Sturt University uh, uh, from Australia, and uh, she's going to present uh, a talk entitled Rural uh, Australia Young People's Experiences of Climate Disasters, Collaborating on Creative Action. Very interesting. Uh, Rachel, you are sharing your, uh, your screen and not the other. Uh, I think we, we are seeing the presenter uh, screen. How about that? Is that better? Yes. Okay, that's perfect. Thank you very much, Rachel. You are going to have more or less 10 minutes, uh, but feel free to take your time because this is the last. Uh, the last okay. volume so we can. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. I wish I was in Naples. <laughs> um, so my name's Rachel and um, with my colleague Andrew I'm presenting um, this project which is currently ongoing where we're working with young people um, on their experiences of climate disaster and we're collaborating with them on creative action. Um, the work, the project that we're doing came about because of the um, the Black Summer bushfires that occurred in Australia. So um, you might be aware of the Black Summer bushfires. That's how they're termed here. Um, they occurred towards the end of 2019 and the beginning of 2020 across um, large parts of Australia. And as you can see, there's some really... Um, bad numbers there. Um, a lot of forest was destroyed and many countless animals, quite a lot of homes were lost and human lives, that's hard to um, count. Some of those occurred during the fires and some of them occurred through um, illness, like particularly smoke inhalation after the fires. Um, so that counts those as well. Um, Andrew and I wanted to do something in our professional lives. We both work as academics at university and we do research and we have a background in researching with young people. Um, and we hadn't done work in climate related areas before. And we both, it was something that we wanted to move into and to do work in. Um, so we, uh, wanted to work with young people who had experienced the bushfires. The community we have found ourselves working in is called Batlow at the moment. Um, that's a, on the right there, there's a map of Australia, that tiny red dot um, shows you where Batlow is in Australia. And I live um, a couple of hours away from Batlow, which is considered very close in Australia. Um, so just down the road, a couple of hours away, um, Batlow is in, you can see in the top right hand corner there, it's surrounded, that little red outline shows where the, the, the middle of it is where the town centre is. Um, 
but you can see it's um, surrounded a little bit by lots of bush, lots of forest. Um, and the fires came all the way through the centre of Batlow. Um, people were evacuated, some people stayed to, um, to protect homes. Um, it's a very small community, it's a small population, a very large fire around it. And um, the fires destroyed forests and animals, but also destroyed homes um, and animals. Um, the, uh, the, the town, mostly um, the, the kind of things that people do in that town is farming, um, keep animals, so sheep, cattle, um, also have um, some apple, for apple uh, farms and there's some pine plantations, quite large pine plantations. Um, so uh, livestock, the um, cattle and sheep were uh, lost and paddocks as well. Paddocks can be quite badly damaged by this kind of bushfire. Um, so that was just an explanation of the location that we are um, working with people. Um, as I said, we wanted to do something that moved into working around climate change and climate disasters. Um, and we were aiming for working with young people. Um, climate disaster and climate change are such huge, overwhelming problems. It's very difficult to um, uh, think about them and it's very difficult to know what to do about them. Um, and so the aim was to be doing something um, some sort of action with a view that doing something about the issue um, has the capacity to lead to connectedness and agency and social resilience and improved mental health. Um, that term resilience, I'm a little bit um, critical of sometimes uh, where the term resilience is used to um, talk about individuals changing and coping with issues so it's not really to use it in that sense but um, to um, work together and do feel as though we're doing something. We also wanted to work with um, rural young people. Um, our university is based in rural Australia so we see um, need there but also um, we would um, suggest that um, there's a lot of global discussion about the way that um, uh, whole countries are disproportionately affected, um, particularly countries that have more rural area, more, more sort of rural community. And um, within a country like Australia, I think what's also important to point out and to note and to understand is a country that sort of global north or western, um, like Australia, has um, disproportionate experiences within it. So rural people are disproportionately affected by climate disaster and climate change. Um, and then young people, young people are quite active in climate debates, but um, we also felt that rural young people were somewhat excluded from um, conversation on climate change. Um, we wanted to do something um, artistic and creative. Part of that was because there's lots of information in climate change spaces on how effective visual climate communication is to the public, to doing something, to changing people's minds. It's known to be a highly innovative method for engaging the wider community in climate issues. And it's known to be more effective when it's produced by um, local people with experience of um, something happening. Um, so the artistic expression and the creative action that we wanted to take with young people was intended to be valuable for them. And that's where that term therapeutic is used there um, in a probably a broader sense, um, uh, but fun and enjoyable and relaxing and something positive to do, but also that it would be as a group, we would be um, doing something political as well, that we will be creating visual uh, images to share with the general public and to change people's ideas about climate change and the effects of climate disaster. 
Um, we also wanted that to be collaborative and exploratory as much as possible. My background is in participatory work. That's very difficult to do um, in the early phase of sort of designing work with young people. Um, there isn't a community of young people, particularly in a small town like Batlow. Um, there's nowhere I can go to talk to young people and ask them what they would like um, in, an, in, a, in an adequate, meaningful way. Um, and so we collaborated a little bit with the community, um, but we really uh, were limited in how much we could be participatory in early stages. So um, I'll talk a little bit about that later on. What we have created, which changed a lot, it emerged and was exploratory in its design. We didn't, we didn't fully, for example, we really started off thinking we probably would do photographs, most of all, and the young people have really moved into artwork. Um, so we have six art workshops and we've done three. There's another one happening um, tomorrow, actually. Um, and they are between uh, young people, small group of young people, and they're age 12 to 18. Um, myself as the researcher and um, an artist, a local artist who we're working together with. I am not um, I'm, are that artistic. So um, they are, the artist is um, facilitating the building of skills in art and uh, is really good at you know, working with us as a group on um, how to do kind of art. We have focused predominantly and primarily at the beginning on having fun, doing something that's relaxing and enjoyable, and on building skills, mainly art skills, but I'd say there's lots and lots of transferable other skills like building confidence. Um, COVID occurred as soon as the bushfires had finished, really, COVID started. Um, and so lots of these young people have not had the opportunity to meet and work with young people of other ages very easily. Um, so um, that, that's there's been sort of confidence building and working with, you know, I'm certainly from outside of the community and things like that. So um, it's been skill building as well. As we go through, we've gradually moved to talk about and focus on their, their experiences of the bushfire and their opinions of climate disaster. And we're also moving slowly into um, finished pieces that, that are, um, you know, really good pieces of artwork that communicate um, their experiences. Um, I have got that last bullet point there that's got sort of questions about whether this is research or not. Um, we uh, certainly in terms of collecting data had in mind that we might do focus groups or interviews. And we may, we haven't done, I suppose, traditional data collecting at all yet, which is great. Um, but we have uh, the idea that we might complete some interviews with young people. And the reasons for those interviews are not just so that we collect research data, um, we would like to communicate the visual creative works um, and we'd like to accompany that with text, with writing, uh, narrative about the young people's experiences and opinions um, and also, um, of course, a piece of artwork usually has text that accompanies it, accompanies it. and um, we do lots and lots of art in the workshops so there's not always as much time for kind of talking and it might allow for some private talking too. So um, we might do some interviews with the young people. What we are going to definitely do is produce an exhibition and have a digital exhibition, digital exhibition online. And uh, also we'd like to produce a booklet which would have some of the textual, but also the, obviously the visual information and would be creatively presented as opposed to kind of journal article or a research report. Um, so I have lots of questions about the extent to which this is research, but I, I am um, really moving into thinking about much broader ideas of what constitutes research. So that's something that this project is, um, is doing for me. Um, I have a little bit of early, um, we're still halfway through these workshops, but I have a little bit of early um, creative expression and uh, uh, 
um, text. We did actually record our conversations at the last workshop, which we were all comfortable doing. Um, there's all ethical permission to do that, of course, through the, uh, my university. Um, but what we have discussed, to just say a tiny bit about, um, what we've discussed a little bit about um, has included um, some uh, tensions around the uh, remembering of what's happened versus the moving on and regenerative um, ideas. I'll just need to show you a couple of photographs to give you an idea of why we're talking about remembering versus regeneration. So um, some of the young people want to um, challenge that narrative. And this young person on the left has been working completely in black and white. And she actually um, is uh, doing art uh, for the, her final school exams. And a lot of her artwork is black and white. And she focuses on the fact that the color that you see with regeneration distracts you from uh, what had happened. And that's a very powerful message that's emerging um, from, from that young person. Um, she feels very strongly that we're forgetting about what's happened and um, also that there is still an ongoing, um, so still, as she says, there are a lot of damage and a lot of pain still felt by the towns. Um, and so her work is um, to take away that regenerative idea. Um, the, the work on the right is a print done by a young person. Um, it depicts um, one of the photographs I also had for you on that image. Um, is the um, pine. Now the Australian forest regenerates pine forest, the pine plantations that are farmed don't regenerate and pine actually has a lot of resin in it and you see that uh, effect which is quite shocking when you see it um, firsthand of uh, the fire being hot enough and fast enough will bend the trees um, because of the resin that's in them. So that depicts that with also some of the um, shoots, pine shoots coming out afterwards. Um, and there's a couple of quotes on there that, that show how um, serious this issue is for these young people. Okay. Um, Th yeah, thank oh, so you. I can stop there, that's fine, thanks. But uh, yeah, thank you, Rachel, and uh, thank you, uh, Amandip, because yes, someone, unplug the electricity from the other room. So uh, I think that the, the, the recording is still active. Thank you very much, uh, Amandip, but I think we saved. Oh, so please, Russian, if you want to finish, we, we, we spend some minutes, uh, we spend some minutes more, but it's okay. Uh, just one minute, maybe then we will continue with the other presentation, but uh, uh, actually, I, I, we were able to record everything, so uh, it's safe, uh, it's safe. Uh, okay, thank you, please. Uh, your microphone, Russian. Yeah, sorry. Yep, yeah, I'll just finish really quickly. Um, uh, we are just very reflective on um, doing collaborative work and how difficult that is um, when there's no access to a community, but very much this was a plan which we had a plan, but we changed it all the time um, to work with the community that we do then work with. Um, I'm also experiencing this great process of kind of undoing the subjective position of researcher. I'm not bringing questions, I'm not coming prepared, I'm not resisting the worry that um, something has to be produced that looks like research. And I think that's very interesting. And um, uh, thinking a lot about what is research, what constitutes um, transmission of knowledge and um, finding that very valuable to resist kind of traditional ideas of research. That's it, thank you. Um, I think they are frozen. The um, Oh, they're gone again. I'll stop my share. We, we, we may just want to continue. Okay, now it's a second, a second man. I get it again. Hopefully now they will let us to finish. Sorry.
Thank you, Rachel, and uh, sorry for this technical uh, the issue. Uh, hopefully, they will allow us to finish this uh, symposium. Uh, if you agree, Rachel, I will proceed with the next talk, but uh, of course, the chat is available to share some questions, uh, dubs, uh, and maybe emails, because I would have a lot of, uh, uh, of questions because, yeah, all over the world, we uh, watched last year the terrifying, uh, uh, you know, extreme uh, uh, environmental events that hit uh, Australia. You know, the, the movies of Koala made the, uh, made, made the tour of the world, all the media uh, actually proposed them very, they were, they scared, I think, all uh, people around the world. But of course, we don't know what's the uh, condition of, uh, you know, the psychological uh, condition of Australian people, as well as uh, the community's uh, reaction to that. Because from one side, there is the climate change. From the other, there is the awareness of communities, uh, the tools they have to face with uh, um, this kind of extreme events that probably will characterize the next years. And uh, in Italy and US, it's, it's the same until. And so, yeah, actually we would like to be near to you, but probably to, uh, probably to, to reason uh, around, uh, to reason about some tools. Uh, and uh, to, to, for intervention, for community intervention is really urgent and important. I like very much the, the idea to use heart and to use this kind of specific language instead of uh, uh, just simple narrative to approach the problem and to create intervention. It's really interesting the way, and uh, hope, I hope really you will, uh, you will update us about the results of this intervention, even when you will decide the methodology and the observables to take into consideration for the research uh, point. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, I would like to pass to the last uh, presentation in real, let's say, real presentation. Later, we will have two video. But uh, uh, since it's from Canada, so we ranged from Australia to Canada. It's really fascinating. <laughs> this I'm really happy to uh, be able to put together uh, this uh, the world actually, and uh, uh, thank you, Sarah, for being here. Sarah Ranko is from Wilfred Laurier University from Canada, and uh, she's going to present uh, a talk entitled "We Don't Talk Enough About the Logistics: Developing a Student-Centered Handbook for Navigating CP Graduate Life." And uh, please, Sarah, thank you. Again, uh, you're going to have 10 minutes, more or less. Uh, thank you. And I'm just going to pass it over to my colleague, Amin, to start off the presentation. Oh, yeah, sorry. That's OK. Thank you so much. So welcome, everyone, to our presentation about the development of a student-centered CP handbook for navigating graduate life. Um, before we begin, uh, I do want to, Sarah and I want to recognize that although we are currently hybrid, our work is situated on the traditional and unceded territory of the Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, and the neutral Audubon peoples. As born settlers on this land, we use this to remind us of our personal responsibilities to the land, Indigenous peoples, and in our research in decolonizing where we live, learn, and work. Thank you. Um, so my name is Amin and this is Sarah. We are both Canadian senior PhD students in the CP program at Wilfrid Laurier University in Canada. As relevant history and context, I did want to mention that we uh, I was previously the chair of the Graduate Student Association and Sarah is currently the new chair. We are both part of our program CP Praxis Committee, which includes the Policies and Procedures Committee. And although we both have different research focuses, both of us in our different ways have been advocates for safer, equitable and sustainable services and supports for multiply marginalized graduate students across campus and within our program. These commitments and our personal experiences as marginalized graduate students informs the work that we speak about today, which is towards developing a living document that speaks to just that. So how do we get to this, this document that we're gonna kind of further explain? Well, one of the things is that we have 
um, an extensive history to how this handbook was created and it is quite intricate so I won't go into all the details because of the limited time. But what I will highlight is that this handbook became inherently obvious to me personally trying to navigate a white institution as a South Asian racialized woman with my racialized and queer colleagues when we experience extensive discrimination and our process of trying to find supports for ourselves as PhDs in a space that is intentionally created to not only be um, difficult to navigate or difficult to be questioned. Um, so more details about these experiences and discussion of navigating a white-centered post-secondary institution um, can be further looked at by a recent publication that colleagues um, in my lab um, did publish an article in the Global Journal of Community Psychology uh, Practice, a GJCPP. So if you're more interested, um, you can look further into that, not to do like a self-plug, but it is there for more context. Um, so while trying to find support, the institution really had us struggling and questioning if we did the right process. There was a ton of gaslighting, misdirection, and repeating of trauma. Once the dust settled, as they say, and in my role as a chair of the Graduate Student Association, I began talks about creating a clear guidebook for students, um, graduate students in navigating various concerns that may be experienced. For example, abuse in academia, power dynamics, intellectual property, mental health, relevant policies and procedures to draw from, and so on. So I will get back to this in a second. And although our CP program did have a document, it was intended only to guide students along the program timelines and requirements. It was very outdated. It wasn't user friendly or student friendly. It did not provide policies or guidelines for students to, uh, for con student concerns at the program or university level. And honestly, it was really confusing and inaccessible. So with this Graduate Student Association we uh, a handbook that was initially created, we use this as an initial step of finding policies and procedures, since at this level, there was easier access to information and resources than if we were simply trying to do this as students trying to navigate the institution. Once the space was established with the Graduate Student Association, we moved to creating a program-specific handbook, which is what we will be discussing. This handbook that we developed from this space was very, very mindful of many factors we needed to be intentional of. All of these considerations were based on our lived experiences or the experiences of our colleagues. The first was ensuring we had consistent information. For example, um, PhDs were told things for when they were allowed to teach. Um, some were given the opportunity in their first year as well. Other PhDs told that they had to uh, have certain requirements finished. Another uh, example is limited transparency around pay skills for master students and PhD students. And we have so many other examples, but again, because of time, I won't list them. So we wanted this handbook to serve as a piece of accountability to students and with faculty and to ensure that we had at least a base level equal access to training and supports. Therefore, consistency was extremely important for us. We were also intention, intentional in the idea that we wanted everyone who was in the program to have at least uh, a base understanding of what this program was and what our community spaces are intended to be. We acknowledge that every student comes with their own histories and understandings. However, we want to be intentional in ensuring that we created in this handbook community guidelines of how we can facilitate a kind inqu inquiring community that was also situated with understanding that we seek to be a safe student space that is also centered within being anti-racist, anti-discriminatory, anti-oppressive, and decolonial. Um, we also wanted this handbook to be passed down um, of institutional knowledge and transparency for navigating academia, which we know is inherently intended to be disenfranchising and frustrating um, uh, and, and intended to avoid um, the ability for us to advocate for ourselves. The often competitive nature of graduate school encourages students to be less willing to share, which allows for the exploitation of student labor. We are very mindful that our program is very unique in that it is less competitive and more collegial and community oriented, and we want this to be continued. For example, although we all compete with each other for the same grants, we still seek to support each other in that same grant writing process. So we wanted to share those tips and tricks we've learned as students uh, along the way and as soft reminders throughout the document to be kind to ourselves. Um, we also know that when a student faces hardships, it is difficult to know where to even begin because institutions don't make it easy to navigate policies. So we want this document to be an empowering and a one stop where in moments of disempowerment and distress, we had at least a starting point for information in an organized and clear manner to begin um, the search for supports without having to jump through multiple hoops to advocate for oneself. So through these and many other thoughts and experiences, Sarah and I came together as part of the policies and procedures committee in the CP program to develop this handbook.
Okay, uh, so um, ultimately all of that turned into a 50 page document that we've created a couple of years ago. Um, and I'm going to just go through some of the key parts of the structure. Um, it's a huge document, so I'm not gonna share screen and show all of it, um, but we were able to put it into several sections. So the first thing is that we very intentionally um, once again, included the land acknowledgement at the beginning. Um, we also have a lot of resources that are shared in the appendices around Indigenous resources, um, specifically to the area, to like the larger area of Turtle Island. Um, we wanted to be very intentional about that. Um, we also, those community guidelines that Amen was speaking about, um, we put those down um, very explicitly at the front so that we all know when we're reading this um, document what we're all agreeing to and these this particular tool it's shared with every cohort as they come in with the orientation and it's made available throughout the entire the entirety of the year and it keeps getting referenced back during program meetings and things like that so the first part that we had was um, the introduction of community psychology that's where we talk about the program values that we've established um, beforehand in previous program meetings, just so everyone's on the same page. We do some introductions around who the faculty are, who the staff are, um, specifically program spaces, what are available to people. Um, we also talked about the different research groups that each um, supervisor has in case um, we do in our program encourage the ability to move between supervisors if there isn't good fits. And so this pro like document allows you to kind of see what other people are working on. Um, and then like pro committees and events. And then we get into the information that's MA and PhD specific, um, talk about all the courses, what's expected out of them, um, what you need to do to accomplish your practicum, your comprehensive exams, like dissertations. We give timelines, we give links. Um, we talk about annual reports that you have to submit to the department. We also talk briefly about contract teaching. Um, as Amin mentioned, there was some inconsistencies between how who got teaching assignments who didn't and so we were able to talk to the department settle what the actual procedures were and put those down um next slide please thank you um and so then the third part was all about funding and this was another one that there wasn't a lot of consistency on and it was generally quite vague uh we have a lot of really enthusiastic people, but maybe not a lot of information for how to um, put together what, what we're expected to have and what we're expected to um, give to our supervisors and the like institution more largely. So we talked about guaranteeing funding, what research assistantships look like, including pay scales, what our graduate teaching assistantships look like. Um, we also just recently got unionized at the, G at the TA level. So um, also trying to direct to the right in places there. Um, looking at different external funding options, conferences, grants, all of the information with the links of all the different places that we could get funding is put in that section. And then we get into policies and procedures, which are the counseling services. If you have to file care reports for someone or yourself, uh, we also share community resources. We also give a whole bunch about um, what, what the process is if you need to do leaves of absence, withdrawals, parental leaves. Um, and our faculty is currently working on developing program specific policies um, that are unique to CP. We also had a section about adjusting for COVID, what hybrid would look like, how to get um, transcriptions onto your Zoom before that was an option on Zoom. And um, we're situated in Kitchener Waterloo. So we have a whole section on where to get groceries, where's a good place for cafes, like things for people who are first moving in there. And then an appendix C or appendix of resources for um, we have a reading list if people are interested on kind of prepping before they get into the program, if they ever want to access anything else there. Um, let's move to the next slide since we're just running out of time. So this just shows you what it looks like. Um, we tried to keep the language very accessible. This entire document is screen reader accessible. Um, we tried to keep to student centered language. We did a lot of connections with the department to make sure that everything in here is um, is like going to be supported by the department. So there wasn't any like miscommunication. Um, and then 
we talked about like the different, uh, we referenced academic calendars to find out like we've been doing some curriculum changes and those haven't necessarily been updated. So working with the department was really important to be able to get the most up-to-date information for our academic calendars and the course overviews. Um, and, um, and can we go to the next slide just for the last minute? Thank you. So we've already talked about how we were gonna keep it student-centered and accessible. It shows up in some of our language that's used in the document. Um, building that community, the department support for being able to get information that was up to date and that would be supported by our deans. Um, and also, um, we don't have too much time for this piece, but just wanted to say that like how we built our community guidelines were done in the program through various program meetings. And one of the things too that we really pushed for was um, getting compensation for this because this took many, 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 many months. and. Um, Oftentimes this type of work is, is done without compensation, financial or anything. And so we were very intentional about getting compensated by both the program and the department. And we're currently in talks right now about how to sustain it and getting the faculty to set a plan for maintaining it um, as the years go on so that there's constantly a thread and not just having new students coming in and having to relearn things. Um, I think that's yep, all we have time. Thank you so much. <laughs> if you have any questions, <laughs> happy to answer. <laughs> Great, and thank you, Sarah. And so sorry, Amandeep. Actually, it's it's the last symposium, so I run to present you. Uh, thank you both for your presentation. Congratulations, congratulations for your project. It's really inspiring. And yeah, I think that uh, you uh, presented a very uh, mm, uh, well, how to say uh, a very inspiring and also promising. Approach, uh, but of course, I think that's that, that's the soul that soul of community psychology to uh, make the bottom-up processes and the top-down processes meet at a certain level in order to not only to inspire the institution. From my point of view, is more uh, is more important the participation and the awareness that could uh, come from this kind of experience. Maybe uh, do you want to use just one minute to add something more if I wrong? Or what, what, what do you think is the most important impact uh, of your job or what is the most important expected impact from your side? Um, basically transparency so that students have equal rights and access to information because before it was really hard to know and I think one of the things that happens with students is that we're in, in most institutions, we're taught not to talk to each other about how much we're being paid, how much we're working, what we're doing. And so this allows for at least a, a document where conversations can be starting points um, so students can start to be empowered to take actions and understand, hey, I'm being exploited or hey, um, I this is my rights. These are my rights as a student and move forward from there so that students are being paid for our, our labor. Uh, we are getting rights to ed education and training and all that kind of stuff. And we're paying a lot of money for this stuff. So we, yeah. And just as a very quick thing, the two of us, um, we have admin access to the document. It's a Google doc that everyone can access. And it's always really nice to see at the beginning of the semesters, at the end of the semesters, when there are major milestones, suddenly viewership like upticks. So it's nice to know that it's actually getting used for what it needs to be used for, so. Great, great, and thank you very much again. And I'm so sorry I would spend really uh, hours to, to talk uh, with you about that. Uh, but now we have to try to finish before seven. Uh, it was a quite crazy organization this year, but uh, it was uh, so important to have uh, your contributions and maybe I have all your emails, so I can be in contact with you easily, and it's going to be a pleasure. I want to present the last two works from colleagues that cannot participate today, but of course could be inspiring as well by means of their, their talks, and of course you can find their emails in the... Yes, please, Manu the emails uh, in the program. The first uh, is uh, from the University uh, of Quebec in Montreal, and uh, is from uh, Jamie Comtoult. 
the, the title is uh, Effects of a Solidarity and International Cooperation Program, Increasing Inequalities and Enhancing Asymmetrical Power Relations Between Communities in the South and in the North. Um, okay, we can start. My name is Jeannick Louvois. I am a PhD student at the University of Quebec in Montreal under the supervision of Thomas Ayat. I am very pleased to present you today the preliminary results of a study on the effects of an international volunteering program. We have very little time today, but we will cover the introduction, the research question, the method, the results, and we will end with the discussion and conclusion. So to begin with, as mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, in this study, we were interested in a phenomenon of international volunteering. But what exactly is international volunteering? There are several possible definitions, but here we will take the arrival of an activity undertaken by choice, without remuneration, and which usually takes place in a developing country. International volunteering is becoming more and more popular among Westerners, and several organizations offer this kind of project. There are also many ways to practice international volunteering, including volunteerism and gap year, which have been extensively studied. So in this study, we are particularly interested in the youth for development kind of volunteering. So as mentioned, volunteerism and gap year have been studied extensively. The literature contains a wide range of studies on the effects of these international volunteer trips. It is also important to mention that the vast majority of empirical studies are focused on the volunteers rather than the communities targeted. There are many positive effects and negative effects that are observed. Um, the positive effects are more experienced uh, by the volunteers while the negative effects are experienced by the host community. So there's like a debate between the positive and the, the negative effects of these trips asking is volunteering a good thing? So in this study, we wanted to investigate an innovative international volunteering program called Quebec Sans Frontières. This program is funded by the Quebec's provincial government in Canada since 1995. This program claims uh, not to be volunteering. And the program uh, aims to be more ethical and to take part in, of an international solidarity approach in support of local initiatives. This program emphasizes the value of mutual aid and exchange. It aims to raise awareness among the Quebec public on various issues related to international solidarity and to create bridges between the countries of the South and the North. Also, all the volunteers must attend a 100-hour military training. So since the studies have focused more on volunteerism in gap year, uh, we wanted to study this program by asking what are the effects of Quebec Sans Frontières? Are there any blind spots in this new approach to international volunteering? So to answer our question, we interviewed 44 people with different roles in the program, host families, local NGOs in Benin, um, managers and assistant managers of the program in Quebec, volunteers and program decision makers. We conducted semi-structured interviews that lasted an average of 15 minutes. A Beninese research assistant was hired to conduct the interviews in Benin. This procedure was chosen in order to avoid the social cultural identity of the researcher uh, interfering with the interviews. In addition, this, features, this research assistant, uh, because of his knowledge of the social cultural context, is in a better position to grab the subtleties of the language and to have access to sensitive statements. The interviews were uh, transcribed verbatim and analyzed using John and Clark's systems method. Um, the data were also analyzed throughout Brussels' conceptual framework for program evaluation. So now for the results. First of all, we have noted positive effects for all actors, uh, fulfilling NGO's mission, growth experience, um, cross-cultural experience, a learning experience. Uh, but the data clearly shows that these positive effects are experienced more by the volunteers. Volunteers are the ones who benefit most in the program. For example, volunteers will also develop awareness of global issues, have new job opportunities as a result of this experience from their resume. They will gain uh, self-confidence and have a sense of accomplishment, which host community does. 
And finally, several negative effects experienced by the host communities are observed. For example, the management of the volunteers added a lot to the task of the NGOs and generated a lot of stress for them and the host family. Host families also felt that they had been used after the volunteers had left. NGOs often mentioned the pressure of, have to, of having to achieve important goals with very little resources. And finally, while well, the program's logic model states that it is intended to support local initiatives, NGOs and families tell us that the program does allow for this, but that is because their work is more valued by the community when white people come, do the work, and carry the messages. So in conclusion, according to the program's logic model, the program's achieved intended effects for the volunteers. And while the program appears to support the call initiative, this effect is not without consequence. It supports the idea of the white experts that manage to achieve host community goals. Plus, there are several unintended negative effects experienced by the host community. So despite the intention to do better and to develop a new approach, the Quebec South program seems to repeat the same patterns of inequality and asymmetrical relations of power as other international volunteer programs. So regarding our results, we wanted to end this presentation with the following question, to volunteer or not to volunteer? Well, eradicating international volunteering seems unrealistic since there are so many benefits to it, and that is so many organizations are creating that kind of project. But we argue that it is a huge need for a win-win program. The win-win program can only occur when the transformation takes into account the needs of the individual and ultimately the needs of the local community those volunteers serve. Also, we saw that even with mandatory training and a solidarity approach, a cross-cultural learning process involving is not enough. Organization must educate people on power and privilege. One recommendation for practitioners would be to examine power as nonlinear, multifaceted, and involving multiple actors. At the present, the onus is put directly on the individual to recognize their own privilege, while system of colonization <coughs> of research are lesser. Thank you very much. Okay. And this was the presentation uh, of uh, uh, Jenny. Now we, we are going to have the last uh, talk of the day uh, from uh, Johanna Noshi uh, and Thomas Salias at the UCAM University, uh, again from Canada, entitled The School as a Place of Change, the Experience of Secondary School History Teachers. In Hello, my name is Joanna. I'm a student okay. in community psychology and others. <laughs> Sorry, in transmitting uh, the history of indigenous peoples in Quebec. Yeah, we can uh, share the screen. Perfect. Hello, my name is Joanna. I'm a student in community psychology under the supervision of Thomas Sayas. Today, I'm going to tell you about my research results. And the title of this presentation is The School as a Place of Change, the Experience of Secondary School History Teachers in Transmitting the History of Indigenous Peoples in Quebec. For this presentation, we will start with the territorial arrangement. Then we, we will uh, introduce the subject, the objective, the methodology, and we will look at the result. Then we will finish with the recommendation that uh, result from this research. So I'm located in Montreal, Quebec, Canada, and it's essential given the land claims of indigenous community to be aware of this issue, particularly by addressing this issue in every speech that is made about indigenous communities. So I hope uh, that this will be integrated into our practice. So we would like to begin by noting that the lens of which uh, we somehow a part of ancestral territory that has long served as a place of life, meeting and exchange for indigenous peoples, including the Ganyangiaga nations 
we honor, respect, and honor these nations who have never renounced their right or sovereign authority over the lands and water on we I am meeting today. The history of indigenous people in Canada is marked by colonialism, sedentarization, land dispossession, the Indian Act, and relationships of the nation. Even today, the relationship between the state and the indigenous peoples is marked by these past relationships. And now the federal and provincial governments have official, officially supported the self-determination of indigenous peoples. Government institutions have demonstrated their intention to engage in process of reconciliation. The Truth and Reconciliation Commission sought to annihilate the oppression suffered by indigenous communities. The objective was to collect and document the stories of those directly or indirectly affected by the legacy of residential school, school sorry, in order to make recommendations. Call to action specifically addresses education in the school context. Here, education is seen as a vehicle for social change. The school is the place for this, and the teacher are the adjuncts. Look at the situation to uh, so a community psychology lens. So there is a political process supported by commissions that calls for the recognition of the history of indigenous people in Canada and the integration of the recognition into the teaching of history. But how do teachers live with this request? So I ask the question, how do school history teachers experience the transmission of the history of indigenous peoples within the history of Canada in Canada? To answer this question, I interviewed 12 secondary school history teachers who work in French have to last to live three uh, years of experience and work in Quebec. My sample consists of eight men and four women. They have a working life of between three and 26 uh, years. All, all interviews list between one and three hours. And why uh, I was able to ask them, for example, what elements of indigenous people is the we how you pass on? Next, I conduct a Brown and Clark inspired uh, thematic analysis to bring, uh, to bring out the most salient teams in the participant discourse. So, regarding the curriculum, more content in the curriculum. Yeah. Indigenous people is covered more frequently, but we have a common long way. Before the curriculum reform 10 years ago, there was very little discussion of indigenous people history. But today, this, this content is still stereotyped or related. The vision of history is still that of non-indigenous people. And above all, there is a little or nothing about the history of indigenous people that is submitted for ministerial evaluation. Participants tell us, I'm going to go with the lake of states in the program, which they put in. He talks about it, and when he talks about it, it's at the beginning. Yeah, we trade the first, and then four and twenty years later. Well, there were the residential school, but there a big hole, and I won't necessarily be able to fill it. Concerning the implementation of the program, the results su suggest an enforceable working environment. No training for teachers, so how can you teach history if you are not training, trained to teach it? Not enough time to look at the world curriculum. So teachers prioritize the elements that are subject to ministerial evaluation. In their daily lives, there are all the priorities that emerge in the in the class in the in the classroom. So 
when participants share, if it's a range of problems we face. For example, buying is a very, is a very fashionable, fashionable topic, but we have to deal with it every day. The consequences of these issues confront us every day and make our work much more difficult. The indigenous issues, its impact, are not necessarily experiences by us. Theoretically, yes, we know that these issues need to be resolved, but in our day-to-day -day work, it doesn't bother us enough that we have to mobilize to resolve it. It's sad, but I think that's the reality. Concerning the latitude of teachers to make change. Teachers talk about professional autonomy. That is, that is, they have a freedom to act when they teach. They have a content to transmit, but once in the classroom, they are free to see how to transmit it. So the transmission of indigenous history is inherent in the teacher's sensibility. In the, if they want to pass on this history, they, do, they will do it. If not, it can offer very little. So the individual variable is very important. Participants say it's also said that, that the Inuit, because they were isolated, were a little more spared. That also a riddle. That's not in the program, but I talk about it all the time. Finally, I would like to address three avenues that emerge from the participant history. So one, include indigenous history in the ministerial evaluation. If it's included in the ministerial evaluation, teachers will not have a choice to teach it. It will, it will be part of their priorities. And two, communicate indigenous history documented by the communities themselves an indigenous historian, convey a more complex, complete, critical, and accurate uh, content of history. And three, support teachers more in their task and work on awareness raising. Raising awareness of these issues can strengthen uh, teachers' commitment com to communicate more about the history of indigenous peoples by making them actors of this change, by involving them. So to finish, colonialism is rarely fully acknowledged. It's seen as a sad chapter, as not a foundation uh, of Quebec and Canada in general. In fact, most history seems to be taught according to the myth of goodness of Canadian colonialism. This softer version is a national mythology still popular in Quebec and in Canada. It's important to recognize that colonialism and, it, and its effect are not just a reality of the past and are still relevant today. As researchers, we, we need to support the paradigm shift toward more human approaches to science which also means rendering the colonial process at play. It doesn't happen overnight, but research projects can include more with reflexivity for the colonization and indigenization of the research work. As a community psychologist, this means supporting the expression of indigenous voice and initiatives but also by accompanying non-indigenous structure in this process. So thank you for uh, listening to me despite my action story. Uh, and if, uh, if you want to talk about it, contact me by email. I okay, here we are. We actually, we, we have been able to okay, it's so nice Thank you. to meet you. Oh, and uh, to this uh, fourth okay. session, for virtual session, uh, entitled Social Political Sorry. Issues for Community.
community psychology. Shanti started. <laughs> it's me in another uh, meeting. Okay, so thank you very much to everyone. Thank you, Rachel, for the time <laughs> for you. And thank you, Sara and Amandeep, uh, Valerie, Korge, Zahid, Laura, and Daniel uh, for your presence. Uh, I think that now we, uh, I, I'm going to collapse uh, to the bed, but uh, no, because it was a really hard day for me. Uh, I'm really sorry because it would be, uh, I would love uh, really to interact uh, with you more. Uh, this, uh, you know, uh, this ICE nine, uh, ninth ICCP has been really, uh, you know, uh, populated uh, and. Uh, so I, I think that uh, we did a, a good job, but of course, thanks to you. And uh, I hope that uh, uh, the inspiring uh, works that have been presented and then the, uh, the lot of insights, uh, at least I had, but I think also you would uh, uh, represent some seeds for, for future collaborations uh, and uh, maybe joint uh, ventures uh, between us. So, Thank you uh, again and uh, good night, Russia. Good day, Sara and Amadip. And uh, good afternoon, Daniel, Jorge. And thank you again. I hope to see you soon, uh, maybe tomorrow afternoon, if you want to participate in the next session, otherwise, uh, in the next uh, occasions. Thank you, Andrea. Thank you. Bye. Thank, Thank you. you. Goodbye. <laughs> Goodbye. Thank you all. Goodbye.